Hey guys, this episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast is presented by our Sports Spectrum Weekly Slant. It's a football show that airs every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, sportspectrum.com. It's faith, it's football, it's doing what we know how to do best, bringing Jesus back into the football conversation. And it's a brand new show that's been going on now for a couple months, and we're just so proud of it. And it's a show that we think is unique and different from any other football show because of that faith component. So check out Sports Spectrum's Weekly Slant, Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, on our Facebook and YouTube channels and at sportsspectrum.com. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to the show. I am Jason. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast. we got a great conversation today with Luke Norsworthy. He is a husband, father, pastor, and author, and he's got a lot of great things to say. He's an Abilene Christian grad, so of course we talk about that wonderful March Madness moment for Abilene Christian when they defeated their in-state rival, the University of Texas, back in March Madness 2021. Cole Claiborne is going to be sitting in for me today to do this interview with Luke, and I think you'll enjoy this conversation quite a bit. Before we get to Luke Norsworthy, I want to tell you about our website, sportspectrum.com. It has all of our content, and it's all free. Articles, devotionals, podcasts, all available right there at the website, sportspectrum.com. So you want to make sure you book that place to go every single day for new content, bringing Jesus back into the sports conversation. And then when you're there at the website, click that newsletter icon at the top, and that allows you to sign up for our weekly newsletter so you can stay in touch with all that we have going on here at Sports Spectrum. As I mentioned, we get a lot of articles every single week, different content, devotionals, lots of podcasts as part of our Sports Spectrum podcast network. The best way to stay in touch is to visit the website or sign up for our weekly newsletter to stay in tune with everything that you may have missed. You can do all of that at sportspectrum.com. All right, let's get to our conversation with Luke Norrisworthy. He is the author of two books, God Over Good and Befriending Your Monsters. He's also a pastor in Austin, Texas at Westover Hills Church, and he hosts Newsworthy with Norsworthy, which is a weekly podcast discussing spirituality, Christianity, and anything else that seems newsworthy. Let's take a listen to our conversation as Cole Claiborne talks to author and pastor Luke Norsworthy right now on Sports Spectrum. Luke, how you doing, bud? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much for having me. It's my uh, my pleasure to be with you. So we are going to be talking today really about a lot of things, but you are a, a big fan of sports. Uh, you're a big lover of Jesus. That's right where we connect here at Sports Spectrum. So uh, first, you know, you, this I got to ask you this past year, watching the NCAA basketball tournament, you wrestled at Abilene Christian University and what I called the fighting Luke Norsworthies this year, <laughs> took down University of Texas in the first round of the NCAA tournament. What did that mean for you? And really, what does that mean for a school like, like Abilene Christian against the big state rival of University of Texas to win on that stage? I, well, to think that we're rivals is uh, like, <laughs> it's very generous of you to say that as someone like who was at Abilene uh, for many years. And now I actually live in Austin. It's, it's an even crazier experience. Um, but for us to go up against Texas, in the tournament, like that was the win just to get there, just to get right. there was the win. And then that the fact that we were close in the game, there was a close, like that was a huge win. And then the fact that like, we actually won, like um, the guy hit the free throws, we won the game. It ended. It was just unbelievable. It truly was something that like when I was back at ACU, I, I finished my undergrad in 2002, which tells you how old I am. But the idea of ever playing Texas in a meaningful competition of any sport, like any sport yeah. and, the idea that you could even be close was, would have been unfathomable. So this was one of the best moments in uh, Abilene Christian's athletic uh, career, no doubt about it. 
That was, that's awesome. And th- this tournament obviously was wild. There were no fans. First of all, just glad that we got to have an NCAA basketball tournament yeah. this year because obviously, you know, in 2020, we didn't have one with COVID and everything. But yeah, as you watched that game, I mean, w- w- maybe did you think back? Maybe what, what were some of your favorite memories as an athlete and a student in college? Well, I was never really uh, as good as the people like ar- around me uh, when I was there. And uh, so for me, I, I love sports more than sports love me. Like I, I heard uh, years ago, like the, uh, the great admonition that if you want to be a great athlete, pick your parents well. And uh, yeah. once my, so I was a walk-on and my uh, first semester there, I was, it was uh, the field house, like we're getting ready. And there were uh, two track athletes. Uh, their last name was Newhouse. And so we we're talking about like our athletic lineage. And I said, yeah, my dad's from Dallas. And they said, yeah, my dad's from Dallas too. And uh, they said, yeah, our, da- our dad played for, for football for 10 years ago. Oh, that's cool. My dad played till he was in 10th grade. And they're like, oh, no, no. They, he played for the Cowboys for 10 years. His name is Bob Newhouse. <laughs> like he was uh, like a legendary um, like running back or fullback for the Cowboys. And my dad is a psychology professor. So um, all that to say, like, <laughs> uh, I-, I got as much out of the talent that I had as possible. But for me, I- the idea of like competition is so inspiring, but really comp- like the thing about sports that most of us love the most are the people that you get to compete with. And right. even if you're like a part of like individual sports, so, you know, wrestling and track were my sports that uh, I had the most um, uh, invested in. Like I played football in high school as well, but like track and uh, wrestling were the ones that uh, I was probably uh, best at. Um, like th- even individual sports like that, like the people that you train with day in and day out, the people that like y- you share your literal blood, sweat and tears with, um, that's, that's the most meaningful thing. And yeah. I, I love the way that sports like draws us out to like be better than what we can be because really sports teaches like, it's not, I'm not trying to be better than the person in front of me. Like, some people act that way, but really like, I'm just trying to be the best version of myself. And that's what I love about sport. And I think it's, uh, it's a beautiful metaphor for life. And yeah, I just love it so much. That is true. Yeah. You talked about your parents and everything. What was uh, your upbringing with sports life? Like what did your love for sports begin and, and maybe what did you did you play a variety of sports growing up like most kids do or were you kind of uh just focusing on wrestling or, or what was the, what was your upbringing as an athlete yeah. like well i recently um uh, called my dad my mom uh passed about a year ago and and i called my dad I was like hey i really appreciate you and mom driving me to all these wrestling meets and track because there's like six minutes of action and you spend like 18 hours on your day off. And so now my kids are in sports. And so I've got uh, my two older daughters are in all-star cheer, which is a whole crazy world in itself. Um, the, <laughs> it's just, that's a whole nother subject, but it's an, an amazing sport. And so for me, like, I'm very fortunate that I was able to do a lot of sports as a kid. I, I wrestled uh, probably the first one was like five or six or something like that. You know, I played basketball. Um, I really love basketball a lot. I played baseball, um, you know, track football and wrestling were my uh, sports in high school. Uh, but it, I, for me, like I was always doing some, some sport. I was watching TV. Like when, when we got cable and I could watch sports center four times in a row on a Saturday morning, like I was in, in heaven, like I didn't even watch cartoons as a kid. It was just like, I want to watch sports center. And so I've been obsessed with sports since I was a kid. Yeah. So you grew up in, in Ohio. Are you an Ohio professional sports team fan or are you fans of the teams that are in Texas now? Okay. Here's the crazy thing. I was born in Philadelphia, but you're right. Like I I moved to Ohio when I was in middle school, but when I was a kid in Philly, uh, this was fifth grade. There was a group of freshmen that were playing for the university of Michigan, uh, known as the fab five. And I just fell in love with the fab five and I'm living in Philly, which is great. And so Michigan becomes my team. Well, then two years later, I moved to Ohio or yeah, two years later, which Ohio and Michigan, they hate each other. And so I didn't have a lot of friends when I would talk about my college team that I was loyal to. But luckily, my dad is from Dallas. And when I was born, he literally had a bag of soil from Texas sitting in the delivery That's room awesome. so he could say his son was born over Texas soil. So I root for Texas teams for the most <laughs> part. Uh, I, Ca- Cowboys are my ride or die team. I do root for the uh, University of Texas uh, Longhorns, except when they're playing ACU. And basketball, like I, I like Luca, like I root for them, but like in the player empowerment era, I'm kind of more fan of players than teams at this point. Cause it's not like my favorite yeah. sport. Yeah. Especially like I, I grew up in the nineties and the early two thousands. And so I grew up with Jordan 
And then I'm from Indiana. So I watched the Pacers with Reggie Miller. Yeah. It just seems like I, I never, I never could get into NBA quite like I do college sports. So NBA now, at least, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, they're great talented players, but yeah, it's, it's definitely kind of a player empowerment movement. So yeah. Um, you go, do you go to a lot of, uh, Mavericks games down there or anything like that? You know, when I lived, I lived in Dallas before I moved to Austin and I, I got to go to a handful of Mavericks games, uh, when I was in Dallas, um, when I'm down here, we get to go watch Texas. I drive up, uh, in the fall, uh, every year for the uh, Cowboys Eagles game, because my dad and I root for the Cowboys, but my brother, he is literally the redheaded child who roots for the Eagles just because he wants to be the contrarian. <laughs> And so that's like a big part of my dad, my brother and I's connection. And actually, for the very first time, I went to a uh, pro uh, soccer, you know, pro football yeah. soccer uh, match Sunday night. And I've never been a soccer fan, but I went and I saw Austin's team, the fighting Matthew McConaughey's. And it was an, an unbelievable <laughs> Does he own, does he own the team? Does he uh, own yeah, the team or something? Like he says, he's like probably like Jay-Z was the owner of the Nets. Like he owns yeah. like a, probably like a percent of it. I don't. Okay. But he is like communicated. He's like, he's the owner, but I don't, I really yeah. don't know the financial investment he has, but he's a yeah. prominent part of Austin and the soccer club. Nashville just got a pro soccer team, I guess somewhat recently that I definitely want to go down and check out the games. I've heard it's a fun atmosphere. Oh. I've never been to a pro soccer game before. It's so. a blast. Yeah. It's an absolute it's blast. Awesome. The chance, like the, the level of like enthusiasm from the crowd. It's unbelievable. It's, it was a great experience. Yeah. So you have, uh, obviously progressed in life. Now you are a, you're a pastor, you're a writer. What are some, you mentioned this earlier about some, some lessons that you love about sports, but now that now, like when you think back to your profession and maybe your, your previous, uh, experience as an athlete, what are some lessons that maybe care have carried over to you life lessons or just things that have translated to your profession that you garnered from your time as an athlete? Well, I'm at the point where, so, uh, the barber, uh, who cuts my hair, her name is Morgan. Uh, she comes to the church that I'm a part of and uh, somehow made some comment a couple weeks ago when I was getting a haircut and she goes, well, Luke, you make a sports reference every week. And then like the next <laughs> week in the office, one of my coworkers, Kathleen, she goes, and you know, Luke, you always talk about sports. I don't understand sports, but you talk about them every week. And I felt really judged. And so to answer the question of What's the application of sports to like uh, understanding our souls and like spirituality and Christianity? Like they're all there. Like all the metaphors I have are sports metaphors. Um, so I don't even know where to start because I I'm at the point now where I'm like, let me cut out sports illustrations because I use too many in my sermons because it like it's the world that like I naturally like inhabit. Like I love sports. I, I recently have gotten into um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and as a wrestler, the transition to grappling it, or as a grappler who originally trained in wrestling and then now is in Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, like the connections make a whole lot of sense but for me like the one of the lessons I've, I've been learning recently in Brazilian jiu-jitsu is there's this belt system so you start off as a white belt and you, know, you start off and like especially if you have an athletic background you have a wrestling background you think oh I can step in and I can do some stuff and like literally the very first day this is the weirdest thing in the world uh, there's a girl who trains at the same gym and she goes, oh, you're a wrestler. You're going to shoot a double leg on me. And then I'm just going to choke you out. And I'm like, I've never even like wrestled a girl. The whole thing is weird to me. I'm like, yeah, right. You're not going to do this. You're smaller than me, whatever. I shot a double leg and she choked me out. Like that literally <laughs> happened. And like one of the mentalities of a white belt that I've kind of tried to take the rest of my life is don't be arrogant. Don't think you have it all figured out. And there's a, there's a curiosity and a humility that comes with being a white belt that I think carries into the rest of life that it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how big you are and how big your, you know, your platform is or how much clout you have or how much money in the bank you have a white belt mentality helps all of us because you become curious and humble enough to learn from everyone in front of you. Even if you think for some reason you got more, more going for you than you do, or you have more going than they do. Um, a white belt mentality, I think puts us all in a posture to learn and to get the most of what's in front of us. Yeah. That's great. I love that. And, and you know, what do you think about stuff like that too? I, I, I'm thinking about lessons that I've learned from coaches too. Um, what are some things that maybe a coach that you had, whether it was high school, college, was there anything that, that sticks out to you that maybe they've said or something that they would do or preach or teach that has stuck with you as well? Hmm. I mean, there's a lot. Now, let me also say my father-in-law is a retired high school football coach. And okay. so I, I just call him coach. I don't even call him by his first name. It's just, it's just, <laughs> co awesome. Hey coach, what's up? Um, so coaches have played an important role in my life. The, uh, when I started preaching, I was in college. I just quit, uh, uh, being on, uh, an athlete. And so my coach sees me 
And uh, he happens to be at a Wednesday night church service where I'm preaching. And so I finished the sermon and I hear the like the scruffle voice of a good old West Texas man, like my coach was. And uh, he makes some kind of goes, Hey, it's a good thing. You're a better preacher than you were an athlete. And I was like, <laughs> is that a compliment or what? Like, I don't know what that was. Um, but the thing about like, coaching is I, I don't have as much like a single, like, right. like one line that stands out as much as it's it's an option to learn from the people in front. And this kind of sounds similar to the white belt mentality, but I feel like the athletes who succeed, they, they do this for many reasons and say like, there's one track for everyone. It's like kind of an overstatement because you have some people who are just naturally talented and they're going to be great no matter if they're going to listen or not. But there's someone like me who's athletic limitations is like you're a walk on on a college athletic team. Like that, that's as far as I could go. Um, for me, like to get there, you have to understand like, you've got to listen to the coaches. And for me, like I never was going to be the fastest guy. I was never going to be the strongest guy, but what I could be is someone who worked really hard and who could listen well and like take coaching. And that's been a really helpful lesson to me. Like going forward is like, you, you got to be able to listen to some people and you can't listen to everyone. And that's the thing about like wrestling. It's a weird sport that you're on the mat and literally everyone's yelling at you and you've got your headgear on. So your, your, your ability to listen is kind of muted in the in first place, but there are a lot of voices who are yelling, Hey, try this move, try this move, try this move, but you've got to know the right voices to listen to. And you yeah. figure out the right voice you're going to listen to and trust them. All of a sudden the ability you have on your own is far as like exceeded because all of a sudden now you're taking the experience and the wisdom of the people around you. And so I've been lucky as a preacher, like there, there are some older, more seasoned, wise preachers who have poured into me. And part of the reason, like I, like you said, I, I've got this podcast that I've been doing for eight years now. Part of the reason I do is because honestly, I just want coaching from these people that I look up to so much yeah. and I want to get a chance. Hey, tell me what I should be thinking and how I should understand something, how I should approach something. Uh, because if not, like my experience is like, I'm, I'm 40. Like I've, I've lived a little bit of time, but there's a lot of people. You're a man, a according longer. to Mike Gundy. Yeah. yeah. Mike Gundy knows what I'm talking about. I am a, <laughs> I, I'm a man. I'm 40, but <laughs> There's still a lot to be learned and coaching gives you a, a fast track to jump into that level of wisdom. That's great. I didn't realize you've been doing your podcast for eight years. That feels like you were very early on in the podcast game. Then. Yeah. 2013. Like I had to explain to people what a podcast was when I was trying to get them to guess on the podcast, man, that's awesome. It's that's crazy. A, that's some it's crazy. That's some great longevity. That's like one of the longest shows going that I know of then. Cause I don't know too many people that were in the podcast game back at that time. It it's like, like Bill a, Simmons. It was like Bill Simmons and me. Basically, you, and Bill, you guys had the, the market cornered for podcasts. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, Joe Rogan, my fellow uh, Austinite, um, right? He like he was going for a while, and it's worked out pretty lucrative for him. Me, on the other hand, sound okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not bringing in the bucks like him. <laughs> you uh, speaking of sports references, there was one that I was thinking of as you were talking about. Your, so you had this book, "Befriending Your Monsters," that came out uh, last summer, last spring, I guess is when it was. Was it May? May of 2020? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, May of 2020, and. I, I, I don't remember the specifics of this, but you'll probably remember this once I start it. Something about how you had tried to, to lift too much. And I, I want to say it was something maybe you had gone to like a movie and your back was hurting, your neck was hurting or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know the story. Yeah. What, what was this? What was this story? Because I feel like this is a pretty good one. Because this, this book is it's largely about, it's called Befriending Your Monsters, Facing the Darkness of Your Fears to Experience the Light. There's a lot in this book about comparison that really resonated with me. Um, chasing after more success, more, et cetera. Uh, what, what was the story that you shared yeah. about the, the bench press or whatever it was the way? Yeah. yeah. Well, so speaking of like the monster of more, like this innate desire to like what you have right now, isn't enough. Uh, I was going on a trip to, I think it was to, to Israel maybe, or is Greece, some uh, Israel, let's call it Israel, that trip. And the Saturday before I leave or the day before I leave, I'm getting my last workout in. And it's kind of like, I'm a meathead at heart. And it's, as a meathead at heart, like I always feel like you got to get a really good workout on because then I'm going to take like 10 days off, which, you know, for a meathead who's kind of addicted to working out, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. Like I'm going to shrivel up. I'm going to lose all my muscle mass. I'm going to become a weakling, you know, whatever. Um, all this terrible stuff that goes on in a meathead's head. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to get a good workout. And so I'm doing deadlift and, you know, I'm mid thirties at the time, but I think, okay, I got to get really good deadlift in. And so I'm feeling good. I'm warmed up and I kind of, you know, go through the progression. I start light and like, you know, adding 20 pounds or 50 pounds or 30 pounds, whatever. Like I'm slowly building my whip. And eventually I get to like the heaviest weight that I've lifted in a long time. And I feel pretty good. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. And then I think to myself, you know, we can do a little bit more. We can do a little bit more. And I'm talking about myself in like the plural, like we can, like the, the royal, uh, you know, third person kind of stuff there. We can do this. 
<laughs> that's third person, right? Like you're, you're the yeah. teacher, not me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm doing it and, and like, I go to lift it up and I get halfway off the ground with the weight and it's not even like clear my knees yet. And also my, like my back just goes out and it just like gunshot to my low back. I dropped the weight. Um, I yell some words, which hopefully my daughter's in here and like, I fall <laughs> to the ground and so it's embarrassing, but then I realized, oh, wow, I'm going to be in a plane for 18 hours. Like I'm flying yeah. all over the world and I can't pick up my bag. I can't pick up my suitcase. And so I literally have a friend who's having to carry my bag for me at the airport. It, it was terrible. And it's all because getting a good workout wasn't enough. I needed a great one. And yeah. like a good lift wasn't enough. I needed like the best lift. And for me, it's not the last time that I have in the pursuit of more ended up losing what I already had. And in the yeah. pursuit of more, I end up with much less than what I should have had or could have yeah. had. I don't know why I was, I was remembering that story happening in a movie theater. I don't remember why I feel like there was, was there not a story where your neck also like locked up at some point? Was that a different story? Am I mad? You know what? That? There, there, there's another story about me hurting my neck lifting weights too. And yeah. the sad thing is I have so many stories of me doing stupid stuff <laughs> that involve sports you or can't lifting weights. <laughs> that yeah. I, um, can I, do you want me to tell that one too? Cause I've got, yeah, like I think that, that, that yeah, that, I'm sure it's relevant too. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this is very, I feel very condemned right now, not by you, but by life of going, <laughs> tell me the stupid thing you did while working out that hurt you. Like, I don't know which one you're talking about. There's so many. <laughs> okay, this is one in grad, this is one in grad. So I just stopped being an athlete and I'm in grad school, you know, to be a preacher. And I have, I take this week long uh, spring, like short course thing. So eight to five in class all day. Uh, after class, like on Monday, I go with my good friends, uh, Josh Ross to the field house, the, the weight room. And my old strength training coach is there. And he goes, Hey Luke, uh, Hey, I've got this new exercise. Long story short. The idea is you're doing like this suspended push up with rings and to <laughs> increase horrible. the resistance, uh, it gets worse to increase the resistance. He gets this, uh, belt that has a chain attached to it that people typically use. Like if you're doing dips or pull-ups and you want to increase resistance and you're going to like put a, a weight in there. And so he says, you know what we should do? We should get a kettlebell and put it in this belt. And it's a 92 pound kettlebell. And then he says, let's strap it around your head. So imagine like you're doing like in a push up position, like you're parallel to the ground, but you're like two or three feet off the ground because you're using these uh, ring dips or excuse me, these rings to suspend you in air. And my feet are high, like lifted on like a bar behind me. My hands are on this dip. And then um, this belt is like attract, uh, sub, excuse me, it is uh, wrapped around my head. And then I've got this 92 pound kettlebell or excuse me, 72 pound kettlebell hanging from it. And so I do these uh, push. Now it doesn't, it doesn't matter for the story for me to say that I did all 10 of them and I did them easily. <laughs> um, it is what happened, but you don't need to know that. But if you wanted to, that's what happened. And so the next day I'm done with like doing this pressing workout. And for some reason, my neck's a little bit sore. Uh, I couldn't figure out why two days later, it's really sore. And I'm in class with my buddy, Josh Ross sitting next to me and I sneeze. And as soon as I sneeze, <laughs> the left side of my body, like my left side of my face goes numb. My left arm goes numb. Start to get this headache within 20 or 30 minutes. I'm getting nauseous. I'm like, I I've, I've got to leave class. Well, my, my wife's a nurse. And so she's working at the hospital. I leave class early and no one's at my house and I'm like throwing up and I'm feeling bad. And like I'm, half my face is like numb. My arms numb. Throw, like it's not good. And so I call my friend Josh I'm like, Hey, you got to take me to the hospital. Long story short, I go to the hospital and I had a, a disc that had like briefly slipped out, yeah. came back in and it caused like all these negative effects. And um, yeah, that was not smart. Not that's, smart. That's incredible. Yeah. That's this is why I don't work out regularly because I would just yeah. hurt myself. That's my excuse, at least that I tell myself. It's smart. Like you've place. never, you've never had that happen to you because you don't lift weights, I, and so you're I healthy. I did, I did have back spasms last year because I played too much golf, and I've never really learned how to play golf properly. And I was swinging mm -hmm. like it was a baseball bat, and so my rib kept popping out of place. And the chiropractor Ouch. was like, "Your rib is your. You have like two ribs that aren't in place." And I was like. Why does this keep happening? And so I was playing tennis not long after that. And I hit a ball and I felt my ribs like click. And I was like, that's not good. And so I felt like the whole right side of my body just kind of collapsed. And so I called and I was like, you got to get me in tomorrow. And so I, he was like, yep, ribs shifted out of place again. So I have no idea. I haven't played golf very much this year because I'm a little nervous about that happening again. So that's why I don't, I just don't lift weights because I'm going to hurt myself. That's smart. That's, that's smart. I should, I should switch myself. over to something else. Then. Yeah. <laughs> 
So tell me about your calling to be, to, this is much a, a, a big uh, shift here, but tell me about your calling to become a pastor. How did you know that that was what you wanted to do with your life? Obviously you grew up playing sports. You, you know, I don't know what you're, what, what you, what you did outside of sports start growing up, but you know, when yep. did you know that you had a calling to be a pastor? Well, I had this like transformation when I was probably like a sophomore in high school and I, it's kind of a, like a boring story, but I literally just started reading the Bible every day. My dad like would subtly encourage me and it literally just changed my life. Like I'd read the Bible every day and it made me a different person. And by the time I was a sophomore, starting my sophomore year of college, by the end of my freshman year, I realized, wait, I don't want to be a psychologist like my dad, which is what my major was, but I want to study ministry. And so I changed my major and I started preaching a little bit during my sophomore year. Uh, the my junior year, I stopped playing sports and I found a little country church and I was preaching out there every Sunday. And for me, it was, it, it was like, I had this passion to study the Bible and I had this passion to share the good news about the Bible. I didn't know what that looked like, but what I stumbled into was like a, a community of people that supported me. And so there's this little country church and it's this small West Texas town of 200 people. And there's like 12 people on an average Sunday would show up there like during hunting season, like deer hunting season, like it would blow up to like 25 people. So that was like a really big Sunday for us. <laughs> and I would go out there and preach. And the, the lady who was like the matriarch of the church, her name is Audrey Brooks. After my first Sunday there, she came up to me and she this check that she would give me for preaching, which was $50, which was like, I was rich for having $50 a week in college. And I like was super pumped about it. And she would hand me this check the first Sunday I was there. And so she's 90 years old at the time or 89 or so. And she, uh, she looks at me and she goes, Luke, you can go as far as you want in this. And that was like, I feel like that's my call to ministry. Wow. And my youngest daughter, her name is Audrey Brooke Norsworthy. Um, as a subtle reminder of like the, like the first voice that was really saying, Hey, Luke, this is, this is what you should be doing. And so in some ways, I think like my calling is located in the teams that I was a part of. And so that's for awesome. me, like she was, she was the voice. And then I found other people who came along and mentored and coached me and supported me in it. And I, in a lot of ways, like, the people you surround yourself with are the people who reveal who you're becoming and what you care about. And I was really lucky that I stumbled into some really good people who pointed me to uh, do something that, you know, 20 plus years later, I'm, I still wake up with joy in my heart to, to write sermons and to preach and to tell people about the good news of Jesus. And I'm yeah. forever grateful for those people who helped me do that. What, what's, there's a lot of things that are awesome about that story, but also what, what I think too is, it, I mean, some people that when they get into preaching, especially whenever you're, you're young and you're excited, you're zealous about your, your profession, looking out and not seeing massive crowds of people at your church can, some people could be like, I, I, why, why do I not have as many people here? You said that, you know, 25 people a week was, it was a big crowd. Like some young people might look at that and be like, why are there only 25 people? How, do, how are you able to find contentment? Not in the, the, uh, the number of people that were there, but really the, the quality of what was happening at the church. You know, for me, it was just like the, like to, if I can stick with sports metaphors this whole time, which I feel like I'm allowed to, because of the nature yeah. of the podcast, like it was yeah. really like the love of the game. Like I just loved, like, I love what I was doing and it was really meaningful to me. I, I love writing sermons as much as I like preaching them. I love like just the, the opportunity to share something that like is life-changing to me. And so fast track, like my next gig was this, uh, college worship thing called it a Bible study, but it was. Uh, like a thousand people would come to it. And so I went from like 25 people to a thousand. And so it was like, it was a big change, but the person I followed was this like superstar in the preaching game. His name is Matt Chandler. He's uh, I think he's best friends with like Tony Romo. Now, uh, literally he's like a mega church in Dallas. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I like, I didn't realize, Oh my gosh, like this guy is like a freak. I mean, it'd be like the, you know, whoever decides to play shooting guard after Kobe, you're like, you, you can't like replace. It's what, it's what Mac Jones is feeling right now. Following Tom Brady. Oh, well, they say like following Cam Newton. Um, yep. <laughs> no, well, that's, that might be a little, yeah, but like, seriously, like if, if luckily there's a little gap for old, uh, Al, our friend from Alabama, but, uh, yeah, like it, it's hard to, to fill in those shoes. Right. And so like people were not as excited that I was preaching that Matt was. And at that point, all of a sudden, like I felt what you're talking about. Like, I didn't feel it at first. Like I was just happy to do it, but then all of a sudden you get the bright lights and you see a thousand people and you see people going, Oh, wow, you're the speaker of such and such. And Oh, that's you. And they, they start to treat you different. And then when the, the numbers aren't what they used to be, like, it makes you go, wait a minute, is my identity found in how I compare to this person? And I think that the thing about comparison that's so cancerous, at least it is to me, is that when you stop 
asking, who am I really? And instead you start asking, how can I be more like that person? What happens is you lose your voice and you lose who you actually are. And I think at the end of our life, God's not going to say, Luke, how come you're not more like Matt Chandler? And uh, no one's going to say, Luke, how come you're not more like Billy Graham or Max Lucado or Rob Bell or whoever? They're going to say, Luke, how come you weren't more like Luke Norsworthy and live into your truest self that I created you to be? But comparison makes me f- forget that and kind of drift off into trying to be like some watered down version of someone else instead of being the truest version of who God created me to be. I love that. That's, that's beautifully said. Obviously, that resonates with me. You and I have talked yeah. in, other, in other platforms about that too. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's awesome. What has this past year for you been like pastoring a church during a pandemic? It's given up any notion of control Mm -hmm. and truly understanding what's happening and how things are going to play out. Like a year ago, I remember being in the meeting, I guess it was a year and a half ago, like it was March and we're making our first like meetings about, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to, okay, we're going to make this spur of the moment decision to, to all of a sudden go online. You know, it was like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like we're just talking, uh, you know, we're there's the way our church governance model is set up. So it's me and the executive pastor. And then five of the elders make up like the smaller group known as the admin team who kind of handle like these day-to-day decisions. And so we're meeting on the phone and like, oh yeah, this is what we do. And this is how we should respond. This is the right thing to say. And 18 months later, we're now just like, we're, we're doing the best we can. We work really hard. We care a whole lot, but we, we don't have control. Like if I could list all the great ideas and things we had planned, uh, like it, it would take forever that never came to fruition. And mm-hmm. one of the things that's even like most heartbreaking, I literally was just outside my office and, uh, uh, one of the wonderful members of our church happened to be up here. And, uh, like it broke my heart that like, there was a, a tragic loss in her life that somehow I didn't know about. And mm-hmm. like, there's just been distance from people. And so on the one hand, it's frustrating as a pastor because you organize and you plan things that don't happen. But at, like at the soul level, things that really like break my heart, it's not that, hey, we couldn't do this great kids activity we had planned or like our idea for what we're gonna do on the Sunday, like didn't happen. But what really breaks my heart are there, like there are people that we're just far away from. And it's like, yeah. you have teammates that need you and you didn't even know they needed you or, you know, you couldn't be there. And that's that's really the heartbreaking thing about this, yeah. this last year is that you're just- when you're socially distant, there are things that you are really distant from socially that you need. And yeah. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying like there are consequences to that. Yeah. Would you say that's been the biggest challenge for you and your church? Just not being able to be maybe as in community as you would like to be, because maybe something like that wouldn't have fallen through the cracks in a normal year. I mean, as are there, yeah. it's probably a combination of a lot of things, but what, what, what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you oh, as a that- pastor in your church this year? Well, yeah. And, and I think that the, there are ramifications of being socially distant uh, on the soul. And what I think we're dealing with now are the lagging consequences of the soul not being nourished in community like it was two years ago. Mm-hmm. And so there's like anxiety and frustration and, and worry and, and just people are, are functioning at a lower capacity. I am functioning at a lower capacity when I am distant from the relationships that are most life-giving to me. And so a lot of people deal with that. Like, and there's anxiety and uh, you know, obviously things at, at a church that, um, you know, is a bigger church, like things are going to fall through the crack. Unfortunately, that's really heartbreaking. Uh, and let me just say, like, there are people who shepherd and loved on this woman. Uh, I just didn't happen to be one of those people. And I hate that. Um, right. One of the things that I, I hate is that we've all been through something. We've been through trauma. We've been through loss. We've been through grief. And Miriam Greenspan, a a psychotherapist says, um, uh, suppressed grief often becomes, uh, addiction, anxiety. And what was the other thing she says? Um, and depression. And so when you have this suppressed loss that you've gone through and you don't deal with it, anxiety is going up. You have addictions that are going up. You, you have like all these things that are the consequences, the lagging consequences of what your soul has been like unable to experience for the past year and a half. And it's just, it's bad for the soul. Like it's hard. Yeah. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that medically. Like it's, it's not the right, I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying when you make this choice, when you, as the ancients used to say, every choice is a renunciation. So you choose to do something that's, that's the right medical thing to do. Great. Um, but it's also going to have effects on the soul that, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with too. So, yeah, my wife is a, is a mental health therapist. And so this past year, you know, me being a teacher, 
her and her job, it's, we've seen kind of the, the effects of how this has been on a lot of people, yeah. especially teenagers. I mean, she works with a lot of teenagers and it's just, it's been really hard. I mean, like at first we weren't going to church. A lot of the stuff that we had like programming was not happening. Yeah. My, my church for the most part has gone back to normal. Um, our small groups have started that kind of stuff, but it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a challenge. What about some of the, the positives or joys that you've been able to see through this? I mean, I know it's been a very hard year, but what are some things that, you, you know, that you're able to still see God is still working and there's still oh, 100%. This. What are some examples of that for you? Well, I'm a father. I got three young kids and like it, you know, church has been tough, but honestly, as a father, like I'm getting more time with my kids. Mm-hmm. I, I'm an introvert. Like I really like being at home. Like if you, if I can work out, if I can, uh, you know, practice jujitsu, if I can train that and, uh, like I get to do my writing, <laughs> like I'm pretty happy. Like I don't, it's like, you, you know, Legos, like the old Legos that you yeah. play with in your kid, or maybe you still play with them. I don't know, but there's some <laughs> pieces that, that have like 12 connecting points as little circles that you connect into some pieces like have 12. And then there are others that have like four or two, like, I, like I'm the two, like I need two connections. That's all I need. And then like the other 12, like that, I don't, I, I'm not that piece. So for me, like as an introvert, like I can kind of thrive in this setting with just a few relationships that I really have to have. So as a dad, like I got to spend a lot of time with my three girls and I love that. Um, we slowed down. Like there's a lot of pace that we were able to pull back on. That was like a nice reprieve. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, during, uh, I guess it's probably the second month of, of like social distancing and COVID my mom passed away and mm-hmm. there, uh, like this sounds weird, but like as an introvert going through grief, uh, like I appreciate the distance and yeah. the space and it's like as a past, like as a pastor, like it's a very like public job. And, um, I, I liked that I could kind of be more private during a time of loss and, and sadness. And I, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm it, like not being able to have a normal funeral and all that, like was tough. And, um, but there's like some beautiful things that, e- that stepped up even in the midst of that. Like I, um, like all your sports fans, um, might know the name of a couple former Texas quarterbacks with the last name McCoy, uh, yeah. Colt McCoy. And anyway, they're, uh, my, my mom passed away in Abilene, uh, Brad and Deborah, who the McCoy's boys parents, they live in Abilene. And so they're yeah. family friends and known them for a while. And, uh, so it's like, I didn't, I need a place to, um, uh, like do a funeral for, so I called up Brad. And I was like, Hey, I, this is super weird. And, uh, like I'm crying on the phone and, you know, Brad's an old football coach from Texas and he's a, yeah, I mean, he's a good old boy. Um, and, but he's super kind and I, I like, I'm embarrassed to cry in front of him, but like they, they made space and they redid their backyard so that I could have a funeral in their beautiful backyard. Awesome. And, um, like, that's just a, like a, a kindness and a love that you find in small ways that, you know, a, a pandemic like this, hopefully other people have had opportunities to be that for other people and, and experience that themselves where, sometimes you see like the very best of people in the, the toughest moments and it's not all we're seeing. I mean, we're seeing some really dark stuff as well, but um, yeah. I think that's true. You, you do see some of the, the best things from people whenever they're really put to the test and, and given an opportunity to respond in sort of a, a crisis type of setting. So that's, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful story about, you know, them opening up their home for you. I know. I remember, I remember last year when that happened and that was a, a tough time. Obviously, it's never an easy time whenever you lose a parent, but uh, yeah. it was tough for you last year. Yeah. This is kind of how we we wrap up our conversations here. Uh, kind of fi- final question here. W- what's one thing that you're you're learning from God or, or feel like God is teaching you right now in this season? Hmm. I've been trying. Uh, so my morning uh, routine is uh, like I do this uh, mobility work that uh like i've kind of infused with like into a prayer exercise and i do this like cat cow like it's just a typical stretch you can google if you don't know what it is um kind of uh child's pose cat cow like movement and every morning as i go through that i recite part of first corinthians 13 and so like on the on the down part i said you know love is patient and then i work through the other end of it and i go and so am i love is kind and so my love is patient. So my love keeps no record of wrong. And so don't, and so don't I love is not self-seeking and neither do I. And then I always end with 
love always hopes. And so do I. And what I've been learning is like God's truest identity is in love. And I love what that beautiful poem, you know, from first Corinthians 13, that many people have heard at a wedding before as like one way to describe who God is, but the, the path to knowing God is the same path to knowing your truest self. And for me to be grounded in like what love is, is who God is. And it's also who I'm supposed to be. And so I'm, I'm learning like this, this is who I am. And it, and it doesn't always come easy, but the thing about like practice, like as any athlete knows is you practice it enough, eventually in the game time, in the moment of crisis, like in the moment of high stress, like muscle memory is going to take over. And so there have been times where I've been really pissed off about something. And I just remember love is gentle. And so am I, or like, I've been really discouraged. There've been moments I'm just really discouraged. And I remember love always hopes. And so do I. And so like this, like this redemptive power of God's identity as love has really like started to form in me, like my identity, like this is who I truly am. And I don't always feel like it, but I know that's what's true. And so I, I try to lean into that as much as I can. That's beautiful. I love that. Luke, it was great to catch up with you again, man. And great to hear some of these stories. And uh, it's just, it's always great to talk to you and, and hear everything going on in your life. So thanks again for joining. Hope you, hope cool, you enjoyed thanks. it as well. Yeah. Talk to I'll, you again uh, soon. Hopefully I won't have to tell any more stupid. I injure myself stories in the weight room next time, but uh, this has been a pleasure call. It's always good to talk with you, my man. And many thanks to Luke Norsworthy for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum and a special thanks to my friend Cole Claiborne for pinch hitting today and doing that interview. He did a great job and Luke is a fascinating guy. Make sure you follow him on Instagram. You can just search his name, Luke Norsworthy, or check out his website, lukenorsworthy.com. He's got a couple books you can check out, his podcast as well. And obviously, being a big sports fan, it was great to catch up with Luke Norsworthy here on Sports Spectrum. We appreciate you for tuning in as well. Make sure you check out our website, sportsspectrum.com. Make sure to follow and subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. We have a library of almost 750 interviews that you can go back and listen to on the intersection of sports and faith. Athletes, coaches, broadcasters from all over the sports world. Basketball, baseball, football, hockey, the Olympics, you name it. You can check them out right here at sportsspectrum.com. And all of our archival content can be found at our website, sportsspectrum.com. Thanks for tuning in to the show today. We love you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe. And we'll see you soon.